In the year 303 BCE, India and Greece solemnized a peace and military cooperation agreement that would go on to shape the history and the fortunes of a vast region of Eurasia for centuries to come. As a result of this agreement, the Indian emperor Chandragupta Maurya gained a peaceful, stable and friendly western frontier. And as a result of this agreement, the Greek satrap Sir Lucas Nicator gained not only a peaceful, friendly and stable eastern frontier, but he also gained the military firepower that enabled him to conquer a vast territory and to crown himself Basileos or emperor. So this agreement turned out to be a win-win for India as well as for Greece. Now, today, this week, India and Greece are set to sign a new, a historic military cooperation agreement. Today, the world is very different. India is no longer an empire. It is still a civilization. And India is now beginning to rise again geopolitically after a thousand years of not very good history. And Greece also has suffered through a lot in the past 1000 years. And it is still trying to find its footing in the world. I am rooting for Greece. So the situation is very different today. And the question is, what does this military cooperation agreement mean for India? What does it mean for Greece? And what does it mean for other countries in the region and for the rest of the world? Please subscribe and let's find out. This video is brought to you by my geopolitics course, Geopolitics from First Principles. The link is in the description below. So let's first of all, take a look at this article from the Greek City Times. It's a very recent article. And let's try and understand what this agreement is all about. The Greek military chief will be in New Delhi this week. General Dimitrios Hupis will travel this week to India with a rich agenda around defense issues. The two countries will sign a military cooperation program for the first time in their modern history. The program includes exercises and joint activities with personnel from all three branches, the Army, the Navy and the Air Force, as well as special forces. The two countries' military staffs are already preparing a full joint training program in which military forces from Greece will participate in activities of a national scale in India and vice versa. Participation in international exercises organized by Athens in New Delhi, such as in Yokos and Taran Shakti, is also planned. Furthermore, the exchange of military personnel and cooperation in information, high technology and innovation will be foreseen. The Gita chief, along with his counterpart, General Anil Chauhan and other high-ranking officials will discuss bilateral and regional security issues. Armaments issues will also be discussed. At the center of the discussions will be the situation in the Middle East, Greece's participation in the European Operation Aspides in the Red Sea, an area of vital interest for New Delhi, and cooperation with the Indian Navy, developments in Ukraine, as well as the implementation of the India, Middle East, Europe corridor. Greek fighter jets will be in India. They will travel to the subcontinent for the first time. The Greek Air Force's participation in the Tarang Shakti exercise has been confirmed. Four aircraft and the support personnel are set to participate in one of the largest air exercises in Asia in September. The Air Chief Staff of Greece is considering sending four Rafals of the 332 Falcon State Squadron as the Indian Air Force also uses them and will be easier to support. However, the Greek F-16 Viper may qualify since Indian pilots have a great interest in it since they form the backbone of Pakistan's Air Force and are often called upon to face it in dogfights. The Indians also appear to have expressed initial interest in the Greek Air Force's Mirage 2005 for which, according to the Ministry of National Defense, a buyer is being sought. Strategic Cooperation Greece and India are investing significant diplomatic and military capital in strengthening their bilateral relations. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Athens in August 23 was followed by the visit of Kyriakos Mitsotakis in New Delhi this February, with the two leaders agreeing to deepen cooperation in security, cyber defense, infrastructure and the economy. India seeks to increase its footprint in the eastern Mediterranean, which its military forces visited thrice in 2023. The start was for Inyokos, for followed by the docking of the guided missile destroyer INS Chennai in Suda, Greece, and the participation of military personnel and media of the two countries in Egypt's major multi-branch exercise, Bright Star 
2023. So that essentially is the gist of what we can expect in this military cooperation agreement. The various branches of the armed forces of the two nations will cooperate. They will conduct military exercises together. Uh, Greek fighter planes will travel to India for joint exercises. In the past, the Indian Sukhoi fighter planes have uh, traveled to Greece, fly, flown to Greece and done exercises there. And uh, the special forces of the two militaries will also interact and cooperate and train together. And it's not just military, but also there's going to be more synergy when it comes to diplomatic relations and geopolitical relations. The IMEC is mentioned, the India-Middle East Trade Corridor, etc. Now, before we get into the geopolitics of this, let's first understand the historical basis of the India-Greece relationship. This is not an ordinary relationship. This is a very ancient relationship. I just told you that the last defense treaty, is military cooperation treaty between the two countries, happened 2,327 years ago. But the India-Greece ties go back way before that. So Greek civilization is, let's say, 4,000 or so years old. And there's evidence that they there were contacts between Greece and India at least 3,600 years before today. You have ancient paintings in Santorini, I believe, where the Greeks have depicted Indian langur monkeys. So you can see that there's, there was some connection there. There was trade between Greece and India. And of course, there was the attempted invasion of India by the Macedonian conqueror Alexander, which did not go very well. But in the aftermath of that, you had the peace treaty between India, the Indian Empire, and the Seleucid Empire, which is a Greek empire. And uh, you had excellent relations that transcended generations. So Chandragupta and Seleucus had great relations. Then Chandragupta's son had great relations with the son of Seleucus Nicator. So it, it was a long-lasting relationship, very positive relationship. And after the dissolution of the Seleucid, Seleucid Empire, th there were these various Greek satrapies, the Indo-Greek kingdoms in the northwest of India, which were ruled by the various Indo-Greek kings, who eventually, after a few centuries, just assimilated into the Indian population. So there's, there's going to be a large number of people in northern and western India who have some fractional Greek ancestry and won't be aware of it. And I'm sure there is some Indian ancestry as well, correspondingly, in Greece, and nobody would be aware of it. So there are very ancient relations between India and Greece. Now, Greece, unfortunately, lost its sovereignty with the invasion of Julius Caesar. And then Greece became part of the Roman Empire. After the dissolution and dec decline and dissolution of the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, became a dominant force in the region of Greece. And it was based out of Constantinople, now called Istanbul. So that was Greek territory. So Greece became this, essentially the seat of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzant Byzantine Empire. So fast forward to the 13th and 14th centuries, you have the Turks, the Turkic tribes pouring into this region. They were fleeing from the Mongol uh, conqueror Chinggis Khan from his expansion westwards to the Khwarazm Empire. And the Turks intrude into the Anatolian region. And by the 15th century, they take Constantinople and Greece comes under Turkic occupation. The Greeks called it Turkokratia, Turkocracy. And this is a situation that went on until the 19th century. And there was terrible oppression of the Greeks by the Turks. The Greeks were made to pay this, uh, this tax, jizya tax, very heavy jizya tax. Every Greek community, Christian community that did not convert to Islam was forced to give away one out of every five boys. as blood tax, the virshme or something they called. And these boys were taken and conscripted into the Turkish military. They were called Janissary. They were, they were converted to Islam and then they were brought back to oppress their own people. Uh, so there was tremendous oppression. Uh, the Parthenon in Athens, this great temple that, that was dedicated to Athena, that was turned into a mosque. And overall, it was a very bad time for Greece. Several centuries of very brutal, very heavy oppression at the hands of the Ottoman Empire. And to make a long story short, by the beginning of the 19th century, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, by the 1820s, the Greeks were finally able to regain their freedom from the Ottoman Empire. And they were able to carve out some territories that were fully independently administered by Greeks themselves. And yet the Ottoman Empire continued to hold significant Greek territories. For example, the city of Thessaloniki was then called Salonika. It's where Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was born. And Greece did not get this back until the 1920s, a century later. And even when Greece got that territory back, the whole of Anatolia 
remained under Turkish control and it still is under Turkish control. Anatolia used to be Greek territory. For example, the city of Troy, which is today called Hisarlik, is in Anatolia. It's in present-day Turkey. It was historically a Greek city. Uh, so that's how it is. So Greece has lost tremendous amounts of territory to the Turks. Greece has gone through a very brutal period of several centuries of Turkish occupation. Uh, they have suffered immensely. It's a story that is a close parallel to what India went through under Turkic, not Turkish, but Turkic occupation. So there are significant parallels between India and Greece from a historical perspective. Uh, culturally, India and Greece too, used to be very similar. Both were polytheistic cultures. Uh, India still is. Greece has now reverted to the uh, pre-Islamic Greek Orthodox Christianity, which came after the polytheistic culture was replaced by Christianity by Constantine the Great. So there is a tremendous amount of shared history when it comes to India and Greece. There is a significant amount of parallelism of history, the kind of suffering the bo both the nations have gone through, the Greeks at the hands of the Turkish Empire, India at the hands of the Turkic invaders, and that brings us to today. Today we are opening a new chapter in India-Greece ties. We already have a significant amount of government-to-government -government and diplomatic synergy. Prime Minister Modi visited Greece last year, the first visit by an Indian leader in more than four decades. And the Prime Minister of Greece visited India this year. So we are seeing a, a kind of a strategic partnership e emerging out of this relationship. And now we have a military partnership that is emerging out of this. So what does this mean for India? What does it mean for Greece? What does it mean for other countries? First of all, Greece is a member of NATO. And NATO is dominated essentially by the US. So if Greece is entering into this military partnership with India, it means that it has the blessings of the US. We have to understand this. Now, when it comes to Greece, their major adversary is Turkey. Greece and Turkey, like I said, have a tremendous amount of history and it's not good history. And the Turks keep threatening Greece that one fine morning they will turn up at the doorstep and invade Greece again. The Turkish politicians keep threatening Greece about this. Now, the thing is, both Turkey and Greece are members of NATO. And uh, Article 5 of NATO says that an attack on any member of NATO by any other country is to be con considered as an attack on all. And all the nations of NATO are supposed to come to the defense of that nation. So Turkey and Greece can't really go to war because both are members of NATO and the US won't quite allow that. And there's other history as well. In the 1970s, the Turks invaded Cyprus, which is a Greek majority island, and they currently occupy northern Cyprus. So that is a sore point between the two nations. And uh, that occupation, the Turkish occupation, isn't recognized internationally. It is condemned internationally. But the Turks persist with their occupation of northern Cyprus. So Greece, from its perspective, their major threat, their major adversary is Turkey. Now, as we know, Turkey and Pakistan have this close relationship. Turkey supports Pakistan's illegitimate claim on Kashmir. Turkey opposes India in almost every forum in, in every matter. So India and Turkey have a bad relationship and it is entirely Turkey's fault. We haven't taken any steps to antagonize Turkey. It's the Turks who insist on keeping on antagonizing India. And the Turks have a bad relationship with Greece. So, it, so that kind of brings India and Greece together as natural partners. And India and Greece are also historical partners, very ancient shared history. So any cooperation between India and Greece is going to strengthen the Greek position vis-a-vis -vis Turkey in case India uh, supplies Greece with arms, ammunition, uh, missile systems, or whatever it could be. Then it's going to strengthen the Greek uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. So a military cooperation agreement with India is a great investment for Greece. India and Greece have a relationship going back thousands of years. And why can't we have it go further thousands of, thousands of years? So this is a great investment, a long-term investment for Greece. India is going to rise. NATO, let's see how long it lasts, but India will last. India has been around for 10,000 years. India will most likely be around for another 10,000 years. Greece has been around for at least 4,000 years. And I don't see why Greece should not be around for another 4,000 years. 
So India and Greece, we have a long-term relationship. So it's great that Greece and India are investing in this. What does it mean for India? It means that India gets to revive this old partnership with Greece. It gives India inroads into the Mediterranean Sea. India is already conducting uh, military operations, naval operations in the Gulf of Aden, anti-piracy operations, freedom of navigation operations. And this partnership with, with Greece will uh, allow India to extend its reach into the Eastern Mediterranean, the Southern Mediterranean Sea. So it's great for India from that perspective. And India gets to get this new partner in this region. India gets to partner with a NATO member. Obviously, there is this entire geopolitical angle with Turkey and with Azerbaijan and Armenia and Iran and Russia that India is also involved in. So getting a partner in Greece is obviously beneficial from India from a, from a self-interested perspective. Then there is the IMEC angle, the India, Middle East, Europe trade corridor. One end of the IMEC is India. And this corridor is going to go through in, from India through the Arabian Peninsula via the Middle East into Europe via Greece. And it bypasses Turkey. And Erdogan is very displeased with this. He says nothing should bypass Turkey, but we are bypassing Turkey. So it connects India with Greece through the Middle East. So this defense cooperation agreement is going to be a significant event that bolsters the security dimension of the IMEC in case there is any problem vis-a-vis -vis Turkey or any other nation. Obviously, the IMEC is currently delayed because of the Gaza war, but whenever it starts, it's going to synergize with this defense agreement between India and Greece. And then there's the NATO angle. So any agreement, military agreement or defense agreement that a NATO member does with a non-NATO nation needs to have the blessings and the approval of the U.S., Okay, so if Greece is going ahead with this agreement, it means that the U.S. has given its blessing to this agreement. Now, why would the U.S. do that? Well, you see, Turkey is a troublemaker even within NATO. Turkey has its own agenda. Turkey has its own neo-imperial, neo-Ottoman ambitions, which are not in sync and not in line with the U.S. outlook and the U.S. worldview. Okay. So the Turks have their own ambitions and they sometimes flirt with China. They will sometimes flirt with Russia and they will sometimes do things that the Americans do not agree with at all. For example, the Turks recently, a few years ago, bought the S-400 missile defense system from Russia. And Russia is a traditional foe of Turkey. And the Americans, as a consequence, refused to sell the F-35 fighter planes to Turkey. So there are significant frictions between the US and Turkey. The problem for the US is that Turkey occupies this strategic, extremely vital position in Eurasia. It sits atop the Turkish Straits, and uh, which connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. And every warship, every ship that passes through the Straits, the, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, they have to go through Turkey, through Turkish waters. So Turkey occupies this vitally important geographic position. And as a result, it's able to do what we call rent-seeking. It is rent-seeking as a consequence of its important geographical position. To have Turkey on your side is, is vital for NATO. So the U.S. has to tolerate the shenanigans that Turkey uh, goes, is always up to. But Turkey is a problem for the U.S. So to bring India in vis-a-vis -vis Greece is one way for the U.S. to kind of, you could say, punish Turkey or, or to, uh, you know, send a message to Turkey. So that's one of the reasons why I would imagine that the US has agreed to allow Greece to enter into this relationship with India. And it's also kind of an incentive or inducement to India to kind of play along with the Western world, with the Western agenda. Uh, obviously, as we know, India and the West have significant divergences. India has an independent foreign policy. India is a genuinely sovereign nation. The Americans would like India to go along with their uh, sanctions against Russia and so on, India has not played along. So there's a carrot and stick policy being used over here vis-a-vis -vis India by the US. So this could be one of the carrots to allow India to go ahead with this military agreement with Greece by giving Greece the approval to go ahead with this. So there's a lot of complex geopolitics at play over here, but it's great for India. It's great for Greece as well. The Turks won't be happy about this. The Pakistanis won't be happy about this. The Russians will be fine with this. The Chinese will be slightly displeased or more than slightly displeased. But for India and Greece, this is great. 
it's a win-win kind of situation. Let's see how far this relationship goes, how much both both nations can benefit out of it. But it's a great start. It's a revival of an ancient relationship dating back, going back more than two millennia. So I am personally very pleased to see this. And let's see how both nations can benefit from this. So that's about it for this video. Thank you for watching. And I will see you in the next one.